Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Well, before we do get started, we want to continue our conversation on the Patreon campaign and then we'll get into Carlton Young. As I explained yesterday, with the Patreon campaign, you can give a regular monthly a donation to support the show. And if we get to a thousand dollars in total donations, we'll go ahead and save any advertising comment for the after show portion. We've had a few requests for that. And so at the one thousand dollar level, we'll go ahead and we'll we'll do that. And you can support our Patreon campaign and see all of our goals and options at patreon.greatdetectives.net. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot greatdetectives.net. Young was a significant player in radio and many of the uh, more obscure programs. We'll later hear him in Hollywood Mystery Time. He also played The Whisperer, a very light radio drama. In it, he played a lawyer named Philip Galt, who lost his voice and basically went undercover as The Whisperer, gets to get involved in this syndicate in order to bring it down. And that definitely sounds like an intriguing uh, concept. Like I said, it sounds like a bit of a takeoff on the Green Hornet. But anyway, he was the second Ellery Queen. He took over the role with the return of the series in January of 1942, but we'd be gone by the fall of 1943. Uh, and give way to Sidney Smith. Today's episode is one of only three that we have left from this era. Uh, but speaking of that, let's get into today's episode, and we have our first listener mystery panel substitution. The original air date is March 27th of 1943, and the title is The Adventure of the Circus Train. Seltzer presents The Adventures of Ellery Queen. Tonight, the makers of Bromo Seltzer bring you another thrilling adventure with Ellery Queen, the celebrated gentleman detective in person. Ellery Queen again gives you a chance to match wits with him as he relates another story of a crime he alone unraveled. Then, at the point where he was able to solve the mystery, he stops the play, gives you a chance to guess the criminal's name. In the studio tonight, we have as our guests Mr. George R. Crowley, superintendent of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad Police Force, and Mr. F. Beverly Kelly, director of radio publicity for the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey combined shows. Mr. Crowley and Mr. Kelly have accepted Ellery Queen's challenge to solve the mystery before the solution is revealed. And now, Ellery Queen. Master Detective, and your host for the next half hour. Good evening. In tonight's story, we run across one of the boldest and most dastardly murders in our memory. A murder on a speeding train. And among our suspects are included a giant, a midget, and a fortune teller. I call it The Adventure of the Circus Train. <laughs> You're glad this Chicago case is wrapped up, Inspector. Yes, Bailey, it'll be good to get back to New York. Ellery, got our tickets? Yes, Dad. Ever know Ellery to forget anything? <clears throat> Here's our Pullman. Oh, who's this? I'm the station master. May I see your ticket? No, what's wrong? Fine. What's up? Sorry, Mr. Queen. The Army's requisitioned all available space on this train. Your reservations are canceled. Oh, oh canceled. Dear. How about the next train, station master? Well, the earliest accommodations available are on the special section of the 11.59 tonight, Mr. Queen. It has three compartments left. We'll yeah. take them. I'd better tell you about it first, sir. That section's carrying Marco's mammoth show, the Midwest circus outfit. Oh, that'll be fun. You mean we have to travel with tigers and elephants and get sawdust in our hair? (laughs) Not quite, miss. Your accommodations would be in the end car. It's an all-compartment car with a small lounge and bar at the rear. Mr. Marco himself travels in that car and his business manager, John Brady. Well, we certainly don't object to traveling with Mr. Marco and Mr. Brady, Station Master. Uh, but they're not the only ones in that car, sir. Look, if I got to double up with a talking snake, I'll walk to New York. 
<laughs> Who are the others? Well, there's Goliath. He's eight foot tall. Goliath? The circus giant? Yes, miss. Then there's Captain Pinky. He's a midget. And Madame Zara. She's the circus fortune teller. They're nice folks. Been with Marco's circus a long time, but I thought I'd tell you. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I've had a yen to travel with a circus. What do you say? Well, we don't mind one bit, Station Master. Okay, Mr. Queen, I'll fix it. <laughs> Ought to be an interesting trip. <laughs> This is solid cup. My, this lounge back here is awfully cozy, Ellery. Yes, we should be pulling out soon, Nikki. Mr. Marco, I hope we're not putting you out in any way. Oh, can't expect normal conditions in wartime, yes. Inspector. Edward? Yes, sir. Edward, shut him up. Yes, sir. We're having a little celebration, folks. Well, in that case, maybe we ought to get out of the lounge and go to our compartments, Mr. Marco. Yes, we don't want to spoil any plans you have. No, I won't hear of it. Be mighty proud if you'd all join me, in fact. Well, how are you doing, Oh, John. Yes. You say, <laughs> Did you tell him all about it? Oh, I left the telling to you, Mark. Uh, folks, meet John Brady, my business manager. Uh, howdy, folks. Howdy. And uh, this is Long Joe Stebbins, professionally known as Mr. Goliath. Hello, Hello Mr. Goliath. Uh, Madam Zara, the smartest crystal gazer under the big top. How do you do? And uh -huh. uh, Captain Pinky, 44 years old, and you can put him in your vest pocket. <laughs> Any friend of Mark Markle's is a friend of mine. Oh, yeah. 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 Edward, Edward, yeah. yeah. pass the flowing yeah. bowl, pass yeah. it around. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Edward. Well, you three must be wondering what this is all about. We are. As you know, I've been in show business over 50 years. Well, Mark Marco's getting too old to run a circus. Oh, oh, yeah, I know, I know, but I am. Needs younger blood. So I've just sold Marco's mammoth show to John Brady here. Yes, right. Uh, John, here's the bill of sale. All work signed, sealed, and delivered. Well, thanks, Mark. And uh, here's my advance payment in cash. $30,000. Oh, Boy, hey, thunder, hey. Goliath, will you look at that? Three $10,000 bills. I ain't never seen so much money, Captain Pinky. Money means trouble. I smell trouble. <laughs> I smell an Indiana farm and rest for my old bones, are it? Well, folks, drink up. You good health, Mr. Marco. Oh, thank you. One minute to midnight. We're leaving on the dock. How about a song for Mr. Marco? Oh, oh he's a jolly good fellow. Oh, he's a jolly good fellow. Oh, he's a jolly good fellow. <laughs> about we get the hazy ways of it. I suppose we may as well, Sergeant. What's bothering you, Henry? Why do you want to come out here on the front platform of the car? To clear my head, Dad. There was an atmosphere in the lounge I didn't like. You mean them expressions of gimme gimme on the faces of the giant, the midget, and Madame Zara? Oh, that's only natural, son. These circus people don't see $10,000 bills every day. Not only circus people. Uh, gentlemen, sir. What's the matter, Porter? I, I, I was just cleaning up my bar in the lounge, sir. Yes? I get the bell signal from Mr. Markle's compartment. Spit the pebbles out of your mouth, Henry. I, I rang his bell. There's no answer. I tried the door. It was unlocked. I opened the door and I saw... Speak up, Edward. I, I saw... The man's scared to death, Dad. Let's go see for ourselves. Come on. Here's Mr. Marco's compartment. Dad, look. Marco. His head dashed in. Murder. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, you have the beginning of our story. We'll be back in just a moment to tell you more, but first, Ernest Chappell with a mystery of his own. And it bids fair to be as baffling as any mystery ever he's been up against. By the way, folks, what's your batting average? Mrs. Neely Jarvey of Lakewood, Ohio, is frank to admit that she and her family haven't piled up a very imposing score of correct deductions, but she says they still get a big kick out of trying to decide who done it. Ah, good for you, Mrs. Jarvey. That's what we like to hear. And here's something else we like to hear. Uh, but suppose I let you folks have it in Mrs. Jarvie's own words. She right? We're never without promo seltzer in our home. And not long ago, when I became a volunteer nurse at our local hospital, I had just one more reason to be grateful for bromo seltzer's quick, effective relief. 
After my first evening of routine floor work, I came home with my nerves on edge and a bad headache, brought on by nervous excitement. Well, as soon as I got in the house, I took a bromo seltzer. And oh, what relief. I'm not so nervous and excited about my volunteer work as I was at first, but I know that I can rely on bromo seltzer whenever I have a common sick headache like that again. Well, now, there you have a mighty fine piece of advice from a lady who ought to know. So the next time you have a common sick headache, try bromo seltzer. I bet you'll feel the same as Mrs. Jarvie about it. And say, we'd like to hear from all of you about your bromo seltzer experiences. Just send your letters to Ellery Queen, care of the station to which you are listening. And now, back to our story. It's a short time after the discovery of old Mr. Marco's body. The car has been locked front and rear. Nikki has been awakened. But, but Inspector, how did it happen? That's what we've got to figure out, Nikki. Ellery, Billy, and I were standing on the front platform from the time the party in the lounge here broke up. And we know no one from the forward cars came into our car or left it. And the two conductors were sitting at the end of the lounge near the rear platform, Nikki, checking their tickets. And both conductors say no one got into the car through the back. So... Mr. Marco must have been murdered by someone in this car. That's the size of it, Nikki. But who? Which one? The two conductors alibi each other, and they both alibi the porter. So the killer must be one of the four circus people. That nice old man. Why? Don't you remember Brady handing Marco three $10,000 bills in front of our eyes, Nikki? And they're not in his wallet now or anywhere in Marco's compartment. He was bumped off for that thirty grand, Miss P. Killer probably wrapped on Marco's door. Marco let him in. Visitor assaulted the old man, stole the money, and left Marco for dead. But he didn't die right off. He managed to reach the porter's bell and ring it before dying. What was the weapon, Inspector? A man's shoe. What? Yes, a shoe. A shoe big enough to ship freight in, Miss Porter. A man's shoe... Size 22, Nicky. Size 22? But a shoe that size, it must be the giant. Goliath must have killed Mr. Marco. And used his own shoe, Miss Porter? And to top it off, left it in Marco's room for us to find? No killer would be so simple-minded, Nicky. The big boy's being framed. Only question is, by who? Well, Dad, we better start asking questions. Yes. Billy? Yeah? Call them out of their compartments one at a time. While we're attacking each one, you search his compartment for that dough. Okay, Inspector. Well, son, this case is a cinch. Marco was killed for the 30 grand. So when we find the cash, we find the killer. Oh, Mr. Glyde. Mm-hmm. Sorry, the sergeant had to wake you. Oh, what time is it for crime and insane? Ellery, he's hobbling. You'd hobble too, Nicky, if you were wearing only one shoe. How come you got on only one shoe, Mr. Glass? Oh, darn if I know, Inspector. When I went to bed, I put my shoes in that little do-jigger on the floor of the compartment. I know, I know. There's sort of a little closet, you know, yeah. that the porter can open from outside and take out your shoes and shine them during the night. Eh? Mm-hmm. Well, Sam, just now Mr. Bealy comes fetching me and... I look for my shoes, and that shoe thing, doggone if somebody ain't stole one of my shoes. What am I going to do? It's the only pair I got. We hit Pittsburgh in the morning, Mr. Clyde, so we'll send out for a pair of shoes for you then. Huh. Ain't a shoe store in Pittsburgh or anywhere else carries size 22. I don't... Oh, Inspector, what do you want me for? Come into Marco's room, Clyde, and I'll show you. Sure, sure. All right. Stay out in the car, then, Nicky. Well, where's Mr. Marco, Inspector? What's under that piece of newspaper? Yes? Mm-hmm. Your shoe, Mr. Clyde. Well, I'll be... I... What's blood doing all over? What's under that blanket? Mr. Marco, he was murdered tonight with your shoe. Hmm. Murdered? Uh... Goliath fainted. Henry, revive this eight-foot he-man. Right, Dad. And Nicky, call John Brady in here. Here's Mr. Brady, Ellery. And he's hobbling, too. Somebody stole one of my shoes. From your shoe compartment, Mr. Brady? That's right. I found two shoes in it, all right, but one of them's a woman's. Here, look. Hey, what's going on? Mark, you in there? Just a moment, Mr. Brady. 
Nikki, is this woman's shoe Mr. Brady just found in a shoe receptacle of yours? No, Inspector. It must be Madame Zahn. Nikki, you better go fetch the Zahn woman. All right. Suppose you go in now, Mr. Brady, and see Mr. Marco. I don't get all this. I... Marco. Marco. Put the blanket back, Henry. Right, Dad. But who? Why? The $30,000 you handed Marco tonight, Mr. Brady. That's why. Inspector, Madame Zara's hopping mad about her shoe, and I mean hopping. I don't care for jokes, if you please. Mr. Brady, is this your shoe? I just found it in my shoe compartment, and one of mine is gone. Let me see. Yes, sir. That's my shoe. Here's yours. Thank you. What was I awakened in the middle of the night? Has... Has anything happened to... Mr. Marco? Why do you ask that, Madame Zara? Yes. Yeah. Of course. Mr. Marco is lying under that blanket. He's dead, isn't he? Yes, Madame Zara. Look. I should have warned him. You knew Marco was going to be knocked off? Before retiring, I looked into my crystal ball. It never lies. I saw an old man lying there dead. Now I realize it was Mr. Marco. An old man with blood on his head. Don't mind her. She always talks like this. You saw this in your crystal ball, you say? With blood on his head. Did you also see Marco's murderer in your magic ball, Madame Zara? No. But I could. Really? If the conditions were right, yes, Mr. Cook. Hey, cut that out. Seeing murder is in a hunk of glass. Zara, go back to your room. You too, Mr. Brady. Oh, Very well, Mr. Crystal ball. Where's Vili? In the name of Houdini, isn't he back with that 30 grand? Haven't you forgotten someone, Inspector? Who, Nicky? Captain Pinky, the midget. Oh, the midget couldn't have done it. He's too tiny. He could have stood on something, Dad. And that big, heavy shoe would be a murderous weapon even in the hands of a child. Mr. Marco, what's all the excitement about? It's Captain Pinky. Hello. What the devil's going on? Why is everybody rushing around like crazy? It's an unusual trip, Captain Pinky. By the way, anybody swipe your shoes? My shoes? Heck no. What would anybody want with my shoes? But blast it all, what's happened? Mr. Marco's been murdered, Captain. Mr. Marco? Murdered? Murdered? Oh, dear, he's crying. You... Midgets, giants, oh. crystal ball. Inspector. Really? Well, where'd you find the money? I didn't find it, Inspector. You did? <coughs> I searched every compartment, no doubt. Could you find your head? Huh? Where are we now? A half hour out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. At the next stop, wire Pittsburgh to have some detectives waiting for us when we pull in tomorrow morning. And give this car and everybody in it a vacuum cleaning, Bailey. Even if the Pittsburgh boys have to go to New York with us. Very well, sir. Yes. Bar. I'll show you how to solve this case, Ellery. Find that money, and you've got Marco's murder. <laughs> Philadelphia. Time's keeping Bailey and those Pittsburgh men. Still searching after ten hours. The money must be in this car. Dad. Dad, I've got it. With the money here, son? No, no, I mean the explanation for that shoe mix. Huh? Killer wanted a weapon that couldn't be traced to him. So he stole one of Zara's shoes from her receptacle. But realized it was too light as a weapon. So he rifled Brady's shoe receptacle. And then decided he wouldn't use either ones. He'd use Goliath's shoe. That would make a weapon. So he stole Goliath's shoe. And in putting back Mr. Brady's and Madame Zara's... He made a mistake and mixed them up. Inspector Twain. Yes? Oh, good night. How much longer do I have to walk around in my socks? I want my shoe. We're checking it for fingerprints, Mr. Goliath. You'll have it back by the time we reach New York. Well, would you wash the blood off? Sure, sure, Mr. Goliath. Right, Henry, I made up my mind. I'm arresting Zara. Why Zara, Dad? She knew Marco was dead. The only one who did. How could she have known unless she bumped him off? Well, that is a puzzle, how she knew. Dad, she claims she might see the criminal in her crystal ball. Why not call her bluff? See whom she accuses. Hmm. That's an idea. Okay, we'll try it. I have a hunch Madame Zara has something up her sleeve, and it isn't a crystal ball. Madam Zara, why is it you people can't ever do anything in the light? We consult other worlds. Light is a disturbance. I must have darkness. No, Chris Focus. Conductor. Yes? Switch the lights off here in the lounge. But tell Sergeant Bailey to have both ends of the car watched. Yes, sir. 
You will all join hands. This is silly, Ellery. She knows it's silly, too, Nikki. Zara's trying to tell us something, using the seance as a cloak. <gasps> there goes the light. I must have quiet, or my crystal will tell me nothing. Come, appear. You who shed Marco's blood, appear in the crystal of truth. Ellery, it's getting a faint glow. Phosphorus, Nikki, quiet. The one who spills the blood of old men. He takes shape. His face. It comes out of a mist. In a moment now, I see him. I see him. Much obliged, Madame Zara. Who done it? The spiller of blood is... Madame Zara, why do you stop? Zara. Hey, what What's the matter? Hey, Nectar, turn on those lights. Ellery, do you think she's... Here are the lights. Zara. She's sitting so still. Zara. Come out of that now. She's in one of her trances. Oh, no, I thought she was dead, Mr. Brady. Gosh, Captain Pinky, so did I. Wake up, Zara. Uh, Thank goodness. Whose face did you see in that thing? I must not tell you. Not yet. Oh, and why not yet? The time isn't right. I... I... Perhaps later. Madam Zara, you're a first-class fake. Fake? I'm not going to stay around here and be in trouble. Out of here. Back to your compartments. I don't think that's expected. So that's that, Ellery. Oh, really? Well? Boy, am I pooped. Find the money, Sergeant. Those Pittsburgh guys and me, we've gone over this car three times. No dog. What? Really? Look, Inspector, we tore those blame compartments practically apart. You saw how we searched this lounge, the bar, the porter's pantry, the light fixtures, the radio, the front... Well, do you want me to go on? How about the people, Sergeant? Yeah, I had the tow. Clothes, luggage, cigarettes. We even examined Zara's crystal ball. No, we searched the two conductors and the porter, too. No dog. Neely, you're a crook's idea of Santa Claus. Huh? Start all over again. I want that $30,000 before we reach New York. <laughs> End of the line. Ellery, where do you suppose that stolen money is? I can't imagine, Nicky. Poor Dad. That must be the inspector's own squad waiting on the platform. Now, is everybody here? Yeah. Freddy, Goliath, Pinky. Where's Madame Hocus Pocus? That Zara woman. Uh, she isn't here, Inspector. But she must know we're in. The train stopped. Let's up to now. Bailey, get her out here. Okay. Hey, Zara. Inspector. Nicky, don't look. Dead. Sarah's been bumped off. Head smashed in with a crystal ball. Really? Hold everybody. All right. Nobody wait. Uh, who did thought? But why, Madam Zara? It's clear now. We wondered how Zara knew about Marco's being dead. Don't you see? Zara must have spied on the murder in the corridor last night. She must have seen the killer go into Marco's room with Goliath's shoe. And why didn't she tell? Because she had her own axe to grind, Nikki. The seance was a veiled threat to the killer. She was warning him she could give him away if she chose. So that he'd split the 30 grand with her. But instead, he spit her head open. Wait a minute. Of course. Now I see it all. We've been blind. Ellery. And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the mystery and I hope a solution as well. Will you be good enough to introduce our guest armchair detectives for this evening? All right. Well, we are in that portion of the program uh, where uh, we turn to our armchair detectives. And since the most of the recording of the armchair detectives in the uh, original story did not uh, survive, we have uh, two listeners who will serve as our uh, armchair detectives and offer their thoughts and see if they can solve the case with uh, Ellery Queen. Uh, first of all, we ha have uh, Morgan Brayton uh, from Vancouver, British Columbia, who is a writer and a comedian. And uh, thanks so much for being with us, Morgan. And uh, I would love to hear uh, your solution. Uh, who do you think uh, d uh, committed the murder? I think it was the one we suspect least, teeny tiny Captain Pinky. Captain Pinky. Yeah. Uh, any reason why you think uh, Captain Pinky? Well, there was... Uh, 
perhaps I'm projecting because um, Mr. Marco said something about he's he's 44 years old and you can fit him in your pocket uh, or something to that effect. And so I think he wants to retire with Mr. Marco. I think he went to his room to ask him and he was turned down and uh, he realized he was 44, which for a circus guy is the end of the line. Uh, and he and he lost it, and he murdered Mr. Marco, and then had to frame uh, Madam Hocus Pocus and uh, and the other guy, the business manager. All right. Well, uh, thanks so much, Morgan. And uh, that's an interesting theory, and we'll find out if that's correct. Now we turn to uh, Dave. Um, Millman, who is from uh, Los Gatos, uh, California, and he is a, uh, a high-tech marketing uh, uh, executive uh, who also provided us the uh, uh, microphone that we use for our openings and closing on the show. And his father uh, loved old-time radio, and he actually played Orson Welles uh, in a 1972 reenactment of the War of the Worlds play. Uh, Dave, uh, you, you emailed me and you said you had a theory. Uh, what's your uh, working theory as to who did it? Oh, man. My first theory was that it was also the midget because of the shoes. I figured that he went and uh, grabbed a shoe in anger uh, and then couldn't see back into the, uh, into the shoe bin because he was too short, so he couldn't see where to return the shoe. And that's how all the shoes got mixed up. That was my first theory. Okay? But he never had a motive. So I'm thinking, well, who's got a motive to kill the owner, the, the old, old re retiring owner? The only guy I could figure who had a motive was Brady, the business manager. But I can't figure out what it was all about. And where did the money go? I have no idea where the money went. So I'm thinking still it was the business manager because he had a motive, but I don't know where the money went. And because it was cash, uh, it doesn't make sense for, to, to do anything with it. It doesn't make sense to burn a check or something like that, right? But if it was a check, they'd burn it or whatever. But it's cash. Anybody's going to hold on to three ten thousand dollars bills. So my first theory evaporated. My second theory is business manager, but I don't know how and why. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Dave. And uh, we're going to go ahead and get back into Ellery Queen and see uh, what Ellery's solution is to this whole case. Thank you very much. In a moment, you'll learn what the correct solution is. But first, the search for an honest man has come to an end in the person of our own Ernest Chappell. Oh, me. What Ellery undoubtedly means is that I'm not going to make a single claim for Bromo Seltzer. That isn't absolutely true. I'm not going to tell you that it'll do all your errands and finish your housework for you. But I do say there's just nothing better than Bromo Seltzer for common sick headaches. You know the kind. Pounding head pain, jumpy nerves, upset stomach. Well, Bromo Seltzer fights headache like that three ways. You get effective relief. Quickly feel more like your old self. So be prepared. Keep Bromo Seltzer handy where you work as well as at home. All right, inside. Come on. Boys, no one gets in till this is over. All right, sit down, you people. Okay, Inspector. Here's the way this case stacks up. We know the killer wanted a weapon that couldn't be traced to him. So what did he pick? Somebody else's shoe. Mark that. Somebody else's shoe. So whatever shoe or shoes he stole last night belonged to innocent people. Not to the murderer. Only Makes man. sense to me, Ellery. Hush, Nicky, I want to follow this. Whose shoes were stolen last night? Madame Zars. So she's innocent. Mr. Brady's. So he's innocent. And finally, Goliath's. So he's innocent. Who's left who could be the guilty man? Only Captain Pinky. Uh, Captain Pinky, where'd you hide that dough? But I didn't kill Mr. Marco. Uh, Dad, haven't you left out one possibility? What possibility, son? That, that the murderer wanted you to think just what you do think. That the crime was committed by the one person whose shoe was not involved. He deliberately involved all the shoes but Captain Pinky. He was framing Pinky? I'm afraid so, Dad. The big point of this case is one you made yourself repeatedly. That to find the killer, we had to find the money he stole. But we didn't find the money, son. And why didn't we? Because it wasn't in the car. But it was in the car, Dad. It had to be. Hurry, the car was practically demolished. Everybody and everything in it was searched. That can't be, Dad, or the $30,000 would have been found. Obviously, then, one place was not searched. 
So that place is where the missing money must be. What place? Where didn't we search Maestro? Did you search the weapon, Sergeant? No, Hench. The weapon that killed Marshall? Who'd ever think of searching the weapon? Exactly. That's what the killer figured, too. That we wouldn't dream the hiding place of the money was the very shoe which bashed poor Marco's head in. But, Ellery, what good did that do him? How could he expect to get hold of the money again? That shoe was a murder weapon held by the police. Therefore, Nikki, the murderer could be only one person, the owner of the shoe to whom it would eventually be returned. Eventually? Well, I had asked for a shoe even before we reached Penn Station. And I just gave it to him. Can I... Take that murder show off. Oh, you're wrong. I didn't oh, do yeah. it. Oh, no. Uh, Come on, Dad. Yeah. I, I, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. This tugboat off of me. Oh, yeah. I didn't do it. Really? Here out that shoe lining. Yes, sir. Here they are. The three $10,000 bills. Clever crime, Goliath. Because who'd be foolish enough to use his own shoe as a murder weapon and then leave it behind to be found? You knew we'd believe you innocent. You knew we'd therefore return the shoe with its hidden money to you. But there's one thing Goliath didn't know. He didn't know he was traveling with Ellery, the giant killer. <laughs> <laughs> and there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the solution to the mystery. I want to thank Mr. George R. Crowley and Mr. F. Beverly Kelly for appearing as guest armchair detectives this evening. And we have for both Mr. Crowley and Mr. Kelly a personal gift from Bromo Seltzer. An autographed copy of my new mystery novel, There Was an Old Woman, just out this week. And a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Oh, Ellery, I certainly enjoyed that story. I bet you can't top it next week. Uh, I'll take that bet, Chappie, and I'll tell you what it's about in just a moment. Okay, that gives me time enough to introduce my friend and your friend. The one and only educated train known to man, the talking Bromo Seltzer train. Hi, Teddy. Yes, you can't beat that for good sense. Fight headache three ways with bromo seltzer. You see, common sick headaches often affect you three ways. Pain in the head, jangling nerves, and upset stomach. But bromo seltzer quickly relieves that pain in your head. Bromo seltzer helps settle jumpy nerves. Bromo seltzer helps settle upset stomach. Uh, you see what I mean? Three-way misery, three-way relief with bromo seltzer. Use it only as directed on the label for frequent or persistent headaches. See your doctor. For common sick headaches, do as millions of others do. Use tried and true Bromo Seltzer. Fight headache three ways. Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer. Well, now, Ellery Millad, how's for next week? You got something nice and cheerful? Very, Chappy. In fact, it's a story about a perfect gentleman. That is perfect, except for one little obsession. Yeah, what's that? He wants to murder his wife. <laughs> Pleasant guy. <God. laughs> so, Chappy, you better listen again next Saturday for the adventure of The Human Weapon. <laughs> And don't forget the other great Bromo Seltzer show friends, Vox Pop, the show that travels America. Next Monday, Vox Pop travels to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where Parks Johnson and Warren Hull will interview a flying fortress crew just back from bombing Germany. Consult your local paper for the time and station. Music for the Adventures of Ellery Queen is by Charles Paul. Production is directed by Bruce Cannon. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company. I hope our substitute armchair detectives did well, but I have to say that I found the uh, choice that was originally on there to be a very intriguing one. Uh, you have a railroad detective and somebody from Barnum and Bailey. That would have been perfect. So I'm sorry we missed out on the original segment. I hope you liked the substitute segment and that it was good. I'm sure it will be, though I, I'm recording this before we record that panel segment. Uh, the other thing I liked about this was the use of organ music. I know some people are never a fan of organ music on a Golden Age radio program. Well, some people love it. I can either take it or leave it. It kind of depends on how it was done. I, I like the use of the organ to kind of create this riff on the circus theme. Uh, very fitting. All right, well, on to the... Uh, 
Patreon individual rewards. Yesterday, we talked about the Rookie Seamus and Detective Sergeant uh, level. Now we're going to talk about the Master Detective level, inspired by Nick Carter. And that's the $15 level. And this is for those who would like to know everything. We help out. So we give you everything that comes with the Detective Sergeant package, including early access to all of the programs that we're going to do on the show. Plus, you get access to my unedited commentary, at least unedited by Andrews. I will also share with you all public domain safe uh, radio programs uh, that I listen to uh, during the week. So I listen to things like Dr. Christian, The Fred Allen Show, Armis Brooks, Life with Luigi, stuff like that. We'll also throw in a full archive of uh, my ebooks in PDF format and also one colonial radio theater audio drama every six months from our uh, approved list. A full list of available thank you items as well as our goals are at patreon.greatdetectives.net. Well now we turn to listener comments and feedback and we have one from Lori regarding police headquarters. Lori says, I really uh, enjoyed this show. Once I got into it, I was glad to see these two episodes pop up. It uh, it isn't great mysteries, but it's still enjoyable. Uh, and uh, she expresses her support for having them uh, listeners as our mystery guests, which we're trying to do, and then says, uh, Thanks, Adam. You always make my day whenever I get to listen to these shows that you put out. You have grown a lot from those first Dragnet days I've been listening since then. Well, thanks so much. I definitely appreciate our longtime listeners and our new listeners as well. Um, well, that will do it uh, for today. Uh, if you do have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and be-